What are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time? Jay, hey man, it's good to have a fellow Ohioan here on the Learning Leader Show, which this is going to play on both of our feeds, which I'm pumped about, man. But uh, it's just so good to see you, man. Welcome. Beautiful crossover episode. I'm so pumped about it. Uh, thank you for offering and making this happen. Uh, this is really, really fun. So yeah, anytime I get to sit down with Ryan is just the best. So <laughs> here we go. So I want to start with a word that I think means a lot to both of us. And in your show, Creative Elements, you, you usually give a, an, an element or a, or a singular word to associate with a guest. And I believe the episode I'm on is go going to be, uh, spoiler alert, um, preparation, if we can say that, uh, which Nailed makes it. sense. Uh, after we talk for a while, we realize that that's the theme for me. But a, a word I want to talk about with you is commitment. And I was reading some of your work uh, leading up to this, and, and one of your tweets is, you, you don't need to be uniquely talented or creative to make a living as a creator, which is something that you're currently doing, but you need to be committed. Can you talk to me more about what it means to make a living as a creator, as a creator and why it's so important to be committed? Yeah, well... You know, a lot of my tweets come out of a place of frustration. <laughs> let me start there. But let me just say, you know, having been at this for four and a half years, I've been writing since January of 2017. And for the first year, I wrote a daily blog. And then that turned into weekly because not only did I see diminishing returns in terms of how much I was learning and growing, but it's almost a punishment to send somebody an email every day. It's not what most people want, right? But it built the muscle of consistency and it helped me figure out what commitment was in this world because we we look up to all of us look up to somebody who's probably a creator in their own right and we see the success they've had we see the lifestyle or assume or project the lifestyle that we think they have and we say i want that and we think that we understand the path to get there but it's just so much longer in my experience than we think and it's usually because we are underestimating the pathway that that person took. Also, we're, we're skipping over a huge part of their story a lot of the times. But, you know, we look up to these people and we see them have what we think are these breakthrough successes and rocket ship to popularity. And usually they, be, they come into our world because they're already on that rocket ship and they have been for a long time. But sometimes I just get frustrated because, you know, I think, I think about all the work that I'm doing. And it just seems so much harder for me than it does for other people, but that's okay. Like I'm still seeing growth. I'm still seeing things improve and it's because I'm committed to the work and I'm going to keep showing up and I'm going to keep doing it. But I think it's an important message to tell people because we're, we're sold these stories of, you know, there's so much opportunity and you just need to put yourself out there. Yeah. At like every week for years and years and years and also be focused on getting better every time. I don't think that I came from a background of anything special creatively or artistically. I actually thought that I wasn't creative. And even to get to the point where I'm at now, I think it just takes commitment because you learn by doing, you get better, you figure out your taste. You don't have to have this perfectly articulated set of or like viewpoint of the world when you get started. You just need to know I'm going to go on a journey and I'm committed to that journey and I'm going to go into it with eyes wide open knowing it's going to take a while and then I'm going to have to work really hard and it's going to be frustrating all along the way. I think part of it though, you, in order to stay committed and to show up consistently each day, there has to be a strong purpose or a why behind it. You and I have both worked with people who are wanting to start a podcast or write a book or create in some, some sense. And the difference I found between the ones who are able to consistently create and to do that is that there is just this, there's such a strong purpose within them and a why that's stronger than how hard it is to do the work because right. it is so hard to continually do it. A lot of people can get started and then they fizzle out because it just gets so hard. 
What do you think about that aspect? And I'm curious about yours and, and what is that strong why behind what you do and the purpose behind it? Because I don't feel like you'd be able to continue doing what you do without uh, without having that. Totally agree because your resilience comes from your why and you yeah. need to have resilience along this journey. But I think what not enough people talk about when they talk about your why is they want to know the best version of your why. They want to talk about like the altruistic version of your why. Yeah. I'll be honest, for a long time, my why was that I just wanted a really flexible lifestyle. Mm -hmm. That was my why. I think it's a and strong one. That's that's kind of like freedom, right? What is freedom? Totally. Casey Nice Nice's version is is waking up and then in between go in between waking up and going to bed is saying I'm doing whatever I want. That's totally. freedom. I, I kind of agree, you know, and that, and that sounds what you're saying, right? Totally. But it's not, it's not sufficient. It's, it's, right. it's, it can be resilient, but it's not going to get you where you want to go because it's inherently selfish in a way, right? Yep. You're doing the things that you're doing for your lifestyle. Okay. Why should I care about that? Why should the market, why should the world reward you for that? Well, it's because you need to show up and serve others in some way too. Mm -hmm. So the why for why I'm trying to serve others is I want to help them do the same. I have gotten this taste of what it is like to live life on my terms and to, you know, be rewarded for putting my ideas out in the world. The best experiences and rewards that I get out of life are all directly attributed to, I put something out into the world and it impacted somebody and they told me about it. Mm. And I want more people to feel that feeling because it's, it's amazing to wake up in the morning and not know what's going to be in your inbox or in your messages, but be excited to find out because yeah. most of the time it's good things. You know, that's an amazing feeling versus I don't want to get up tomorrow because I don't want to go to work and I don't want to respond to the things that are expected of me. It's a totally different experience. And I want people to feel that. And, um, you know, there are only a few ways to do that, I think. And I think they all relate to being a creator. Yeah. So I want to help more people get that. The So Jay, I think, I know this is crossover, but I think a lot of lot of the the people and the individual avatar of listening to my show is usually someone who actually works within a, a corporate America job, a mid level type manager, who is ambitious and has uh, big goals and they want to exceed them. But a lot of them that I hear from also have this kind of nagging thing they're doing on the side that is like they they love it whatever even if it's just playing guitar or it's uh, in a lot of cases of podcasts or writing what what I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on what you say to that person that they they their why is I need to support my family right I have to pay the bills and that's why I had this job it's a good job good company good job good paycheck supports the most important people to me but also has this kind of, I'm a creator. And so how do you scratch that itch for that person? What advice do you have for them? I'm curious. Look, those, those constraints are real and you can't ignore them. You have to take them into account. I had a real light bulb or, you know, kind of like deep breath, relaxing moment when I read The Artist's Way by Julie Cameron. And that's a book that's widely credited with talking about uh, a concept of morning pages, which mm -hmm. is you wake up in the morning, you write three pages, handwritten stream of consciousness, just to get your thoughts onto the paper. And then you can go about your day. You can kind of unlock your creativity. But another part of that book that I absolutely loved was she talked about this idea of being a shadow artist where most people who have this feeling of I'm not creative, I'm not good enough. That's actually a signal that you are and you can find it in the careers that you follow closely that you haven't really jumped into. It could be the person that's playing guitar. For me, it was uh, consuming just a ton of comedy podcasts and then learning about the world of Hollywood and watching a bunch of film. Like there's a part of me that really loves that world of production and storytelling. But for a long time, I was also in the world of working a job because I didn't think I was creative. I didn't think that could be me. But uh, by doing the creative act of writing every day in 2017, I started to build that muscle. But what I really want to tell this person who's in the job and they feel like I have these constraints, but I'm creative and I want to do this. I would just challenge you to expand your concept of employment and compensation. Because if you look at your job, what you essentially have is an exclusive 
contract with a client who's paying you 40 hours a week, who's making you sign non-competes, who's also probably offering you retirement and healthcare. But these are all benefits you can still enjoy when you're self-employed. It's just that the makeup of your time looks different. So like, just think about the total amount of time you have available to you. In the beginning, you're probably gonna sell some amount of that for some amount of money. But if you can retain some amount and some creative energy to explore the creative side of you, you can start to build up the things that you need to build a life on your terms that's compensating you differently. And it may feel like a leap to leave the full-time job, but a lot of the freelancers I work with, their first client is their former employer yeah. because you can go to them and say, hey, I wanna to move to freelance full-time. You're not gonna pay me benefits. I'm coming to you first to offer you you know, 20 hours of my week. And a lot of people jump at that because it's painful to hire and train somebody new they would rather keep you there to keep the processes in place or to at least train a replacement. So it's, it's really just thinking differently about how much of your time you're selling and how you're getting compensated for it. What about this, this term of that I'm sure you hear and I hear is I'm not creative. That's, that's for other people. I know you've even said this, like you've said it yourself, me too. W what about for that person who's like, ah, I don't think this one applies to me. I'm not creative. I I'm not really, I don't need to be, I don't really want to be. It seems like a lot of work. I don't know the benefits of that as, as well as your response to when somebody tells you that. I had the same exact lie and it took a lot of the same undoing. exact lie. Yes. Yes. I mean, it's a, it's, I call it a lie. Now it was at least a limiting belief, right? Gotcha. Um, I just think everybody is inherently creative in some ways because creativity is problem solving. Um, I had someone on creative elements, his name is Alan Gannett, wrote a book called The Creative Curve. He defined creativity as something that was novel and valuable. And we're all doing things that are novel and valuable all the time. Uh, it might just be finding a way to make sure that your uh, new bench that you set in the entryway doesn't rock on the floor because the floor is uneven. When you find a solution to that, it's probably a novel and valuable solution to your, your wife, your fiance, uh, your significant other, other, that's a creative solution. There are creative acts in our everyday life. And once you realize that you are capable of coming up with them and you stop playing that tape, that limiting belief of I'm not creative, you get out of your own way and allow yourself to see the things that are creative. Now, this is kind of crazy to say, but I often find myself as one of the more creative thinkers in a room, um, because I'm really good at like systems thinking and constraints put you in a system and creativity is like, what does systems thinking mean? Well, figuring out like the process to make things work. It's, it's dealing with constraints. It's dealing with, uh, outcomes and it's often, you know, engineering a solution that satisfies a bunch of cons constraints, you know, finding okay. the input that gets to that output. And that's a lot of what creative is. Creativity requires constraints so that you can say, here is the solution or here's the thing that we should do because X, Y, and Z, and this is why it's novel and valuable. Um, I'm going to pull on the thread of a few of your tweets uh, because I think it's a great place to jump from, okay? Okay. Uh, so my first job when I got done playing football was an inside uh, I was a new business telephonic sales rep. So that was new business, meaning I had to call on people that didn't currently use our product at LexisNexis. So they're using a competitor and convince them to change. Tough job, smile and dial, pound the phones, right? Tons of calls and very low base salary, but really high upside if you did well. You, you have a tweet that says, sales is a scorecard for storytelling. Uh, what do you mean by that? I mean by that, you know, a lot of people talk about money is a scorecard itself. And in some positions that makes some sense, but you have a, an easy way to know how good you are at storytelling by the conversion of sales or, or getting that outcome, you know, because a sale is usually just a story itself. There was a period of time where I had, um, one of those sticky envelope mailer things on my wallet and I wrote on it, why are you buying this? So that mm -hmm. I remembered every time I pulled out my wallet and pulled out my credit card, that I was telling myself a story in that moment, why I needed that thing. 
And it wasn't that I was trying to save money, although that was a byproduct. I just wanted to recognize what is this, what is the subconscious story I'm telling myself to justify this purchase. And you start to realize that everybody is impacted by stories. And if you help them tell the story to themselves, why this is a good purchase, they're going to do it. Um, so if you like really focus on storytelling and you have something to sell, you can directly measure, you know, how good I am at storytelling by how much am I converting into sales right now? Hmm. Um, another, another part, uh, one of your episodes of your show was with, um, mutual friend of ours. I did a live podcast in Columbus with James clear. Uh, you also attended a live show I did in Columbus cause that's where you live with a uh, Jenny Burton Bauer. But the, the part of your James clear conversation that I really liked, and I want to talk to him about next time I, I speak with him too, was the idea of doing a plus work. And, um, I loved, cause I think a plus work applies in any industry and in any line of work, regardless of what you're doing of this mindset of doing that, what is, what is a plus work all about? And, and how do we, uh, I guess, engineer the mindset to, to value that and strive for that. I think James does break it down really well in that episode. And he thinks about it as kind of a power law. Um, and this is, this is mathematically what a power law is. It basically means that the number two result, think about it from a Google search terms because it applies to Google search terms. The number two result on Google gets half the number of clicks as the number one result. Mm. The number three result gets a third the number of clicks as the number one result. And if you go down to the 10th uh, result, which is still on the first page, it gets one tenth the number of clicks as the first result. And if you visualize that, it's an exponential growth curve. So A plus work is saying, I realize there are far higher returns at the far end of the spectrum in that growth curve where I can be that number one result, number one result. I'm literally going to get twice as much attention as the number two result in the world. That is an incredible resource, but you have so much more value if you are that number one result. So when you're creating something, when you're creating anything, anything that you want to get attention, being that a plus level of quality is where it's unlocked because if you think back to grade school an a plus was you know like a 98 and above mm -hmm. um which is literally on a 100 point scale number one or number two right so to get a plus work you need to be above everything else out there and it's a huge threshold to cross but if you cross it the returns are just so much higher i i think of this as the the mindset is if you're gonna do it then do it and what i mean by that is like let's say for a, a leader in a business who's gonna host a town hall meeting or they're sending an email to 500 people because that's how many people report up through them that is very important and that needs to be a plus work the town hall you need to practice you need to prepare you need to treat it that it, it must be a plus work that email should be edited. So your, your mentors should look at it before you click send. Th that's important. Or if you don't, if you say, Hey man, you don't understand. I don't have the time for that. Then delete it. Don't send it. I think a plus work applies to leaders who value excellence. Like this is why I, you could even sense me getting emotional about it. It's so important. If you're going to decide to do it, then do it instead of saying like, let me just put out a bunch of C's because I'm just trying to spray and pray type of approach. I, I really identify with this A plus work. Yeah. I tell, I have ambivalent feelings on this because in the beginning, when you're trying to find your way and you're trying to find your voice, yeah, it's probably not worth trying to chase A plus work because it's arguably beyond what you can create at that time until you Good. get a lot of reps. Good call. Yeah. Um, and I tell people like in the beginning, you need to pass what I call the regret test where if you say, Hey, I made this, you should check it out. If somebody takes you up on that, they just need to not regret it. So the next time you do it, they'll do it again. If they regret it, they might stop forever. So in the beginning, it's like, I need to pass a regret test. I can be B plus level quality with a plus level consistency. And that's good. But you get to a point where if you want to really, really go far, I think you do need to focus on the quality. And I think a lot about the term remarkable, 
like the literal definition of remarkable. And I want to make remarkable work. Remarkable meaning that when somebody sees it, they can't help but talk about how different it is, how impactful it is, how much better it is. Because in a world of infinite choice and infinite information, only the few remarkable things catch on and get shared. And sharing is like one of the two biggest drivers of growth and probably the more important, you know, if you think about organic search, I'm I'm talking very much in terms of content right now, Mm -hmm. but there are really two channels of growth. One of them being organic search, Mm -hmm. the other being uh, sharing from the audience, right? And organic search is great, but the most interesting people aren't just searching on Google for certain things all day and coming across your work. Like it's coming to them because they have a highly curated world around them Mm -hmm. and the best things get passed to them. They're not finding it in search. It's really great to build an audience in mass through search, but it's not always the most high level aspirational reader, subscriber, things like that. To get there, you really have to focus on quality, make something remarkable, do this A plus work. There, I, I don't know if there's anything more powerful than a genuine referral from somebody I trust. There, right. I mean, if they like read this book, uh, watch this documentary, whatever, you check out this podcast. I mean, for the people in my life that I'm close to, that I believe in, that I understand that we kind of are on the same trajectory of growth and learning, I don't, I just go and do it. And so I think to, 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 to think about, am I creating something that, is shareable that someone's going to want to refer to others as i said whether it's as a, an independent creator building a business or a leader within a business where your email is so compelling and so inspiring and this is possible i've seen them that people are forwarding it to their friends who don't even work there like that's what i would try to think of when writing when 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 writing that like look at my look at the leader i'm fortunate enough to work with look what she says this is this is amazing and, and, and this is what I'm striving for. Like, I don't see any reason not to strive for that, not to think about that. I, I remember talk, having Jay having a conversation with somebody about excellence and he goes, you know, what's number one when it comes to excellence this is a big thing with my show. And I, I'm, I'm like, what's that? He goes, you have to value it first. I'm like, mm, good point. You have to value it first actually like care enough that mm-hmm. that something is excellent and i really yeah um identify with that yeah the bar unfortunately gets higher all the time yep you know i think back to like early 2000s uh when youtube maybe existed but maybe didn't exist yet and you would find videos online on like e-bombs world you know <laughs> and it's like these three minute super grainy really weird videos that would go viral like the the numa numa video of the of the, of the guy dancing right <laughs> That was the type of thing that went viral back in the day. That is like nothing now. You know, you have to have the most incredible, beautiful, well shot, thoughtful, differentiated type of thing for someone to share it because the level of quality and our expectations are just so much higher. And it's only going to keep going in that direction. Luckily, you know, the creator tools are improving all the time. So you can look good enough and it's more about the message behind the medium. Mm-hmm. But it's harder all the time to to hit that A plus level. Yeah, uh, I want to talk about community, Jay. I think this is this is something you're known for. Um, uh, I would say people go to you to learn about how to build community, and you've written some some really useful posts on this. Talked about it on Creative Elements as well, um, and I, I love that uh, y- you wrote. Um, Community traces back to the late 14th century with both French and Latin roots. Community was used to describe a number of people associated together by the fact of residents in the same locality, as well as the common people, uh, meaning not rulers or the clergy. So can you share more what your fascination is with community? And and we'll dive in a little bit deeper about some of your work as well as community goes um, uh, to. The internet's so funny, you know, everything that is old becomes new again. And now community is having a moment as if building community is a new thing, but it's like the oldest thing in human existence. 
it's it goes all the way back to just people being around each other we're social animals yeah and we always have cared and will care about each other and will want to be around each other and benefit from one another so you know my my fascination with community is the same as everyone else's innate primal fascination with community which is i just want to be around people i care about and to help them and serve them and that's one of the most important things to me psychologically physiology on this planet we had a really interesting year in 2020 where our access to community changed a lot for most people right and i think that's part of what accelerated this conversation of online community because Mm -hmm. we needed it if we couldn't be around people in close proximity which we've been sort of systematically been forcing for centuries now you know we've we've gone from small villages where we all lived super close together to now we have these highway grid systems and we live in houses as independent people um we've just forced ourselves away from physical community in a lot of ways but in 2020 a lot of us were forced into our homes and didn't get to see our people but we still had this need for connection belonging being around people that we care about and that care about us and you know that's something else that i want to help facilitate because i think i've learned a bit about it Mm -hmm. but it wasn't when i was focusing on it it wasn't the topic that i was doing i was just trying to connect people because i saw the value in it you know when i started building community it was at events hosting startup weekend these 72 hour marathons of how to start a business that was actually what people thought they were going for they thought they were going to this thing to start a company they left saying my life has changed because i just met a hundred new people Mm. who think like me and care about the things that i care about that was what stuck you know Mm -hmm. that's how people started to regard those events and that was the mission that i was on when i was doing that is i want to help people change their environment and the people around them you know it goes back to that old jim Rohn quote of being the average of the five people you spend the most time around you can control that more than ever now even if it is not in person all the time yeah i mean i i'm a firm believer that you you will rise or fall rise or, or fall to the level of your peer group and and that's what you're you're so focused on and you build a business called unreal collective um which i know started small like any business started small and then grew to the point to where uh, the likes of Pat Flynn and his company wanted to acquire uh, the business that you built. Can you share more about the building of Unreal Collective into the, the eventual acquisition by Pat and his team? Like anything else that I do, it's not that I started it with any type of master plan. You know, it's mm-hmm. really hard to choreograph and look out and say, here are the exact steps I'm going to take and here's the outcome that's going to happen. When I started Unreal, It was what I thought would be, you know, a good economic engine to build the rest of what I wanted to build. We we started this interview talking about freedom and my why around wanting to build a flexible lifestyle. And when you are working for yourself, your most precious resource is time. Anybody's most precious resource is time. But I needed to figure out how can I provide value to people and earn an income from it, but not use all of my time in those services so I could retain some time. Mm-hmm. And at the, then it was more about just like exploration. I wanted to hold some time and space to explore what I wanted to do and what I wanted to build. And then it became, okay, actually content is really interesting to me. I like podcasting. I like writing. I like making courses. Those things take a lot of time. So I need to find an engine that can pay the bills, provide value to people and save the time and space to do that. So unreal came out of a conversation I had with Kwame Christian, who has been on the podcast and is also a Columbus guy. I was telling him that I was about to leave my job and I didn't know what I was going to do. And he said, if I were you, I would consider facilitating mastermind groups. And I had no idea what that word was. (laughs) And he explained, he's like, I'm a lawyer. I meet with uh, a few other lawyers who are also business, business owners and we help each other grow our practice. And I had a pretty good network then because of things like startup weekend, because I'd been building community Uh, sort of implicitly Mm -hmm. and I thought oh yes I understand there is value to be derived from getting people together helping them talk facilitating discussion that's going to help them do the things that they're trying to do if I can help other people get to their goals that's valuable I think I can do that 
So I just started doing that. I started putting together small groups of people that were running similar businesses. I thought it was going to be startup founders, very quickly became mostly uh, client service providers. And at the end of the 12 weeks, which is the length of the program that I worked them through, I wanted to keep in touch. I wanted to keep supporting them. So I created a Slack community. And after you finished the program or even during the program, you got put into the Slack so that even if we weren't on a live call, you could communicate with anybody else in the community, ask questions, get support. And that grew for three years to nearly 115 people that I had worked with directly. And because I was very slowly integrating new people into that community, I implicitly did a really good job of introducing them to one another and building ties between them, which is what a strong community is. Strong one-to-one ties a bunch of times over that is not you know controlled or dictated by one person and spi saw what i had built in the way that people regarded That's that community. company yeah yeah, yeah smart That's passive income yep. they saw what i had built and they said community is something that we're really invested in for the future of spi and we would love your expertise to come in and help us build that community and in fact why don't you stop splitting your efforts and bring Unreal into the SPI community too? Wow. Uh, What was that? What was the, I'm fascinated by like acquisitions and you don't have to get into the details of the money. And if you don't want, I understand that aspect of it, but I'm just curious, like how it went from this conversation of like, let's work together to the full blown and acquiring your business. And then you working with, with SPI. Well, it started with, uh, consulting for them. I was uh, basically okay. doing a small amount of work each month to help them get their community ready. And then I helped them, uh, you know, shepherd the beginning of that community. I helped them hire our, our full-time community manager, Jill, who's fantastic. And it just became apparent that they had a lot of big plans for community, but they didn't necessarily know the best path there. And they thought I knew it better. And, uh, Matt Gartland put it out to me, said, what would it look like for you to come do this full time? And I said, I just have too much going on. Like, (laughs) I can't do that. I have too much going on. And he said, well, what if we purchased Unreal and brought the community into SPI? That'll take something off your plate, which was at the time, like a huge chunk of my time. And that was really interesting to me because the SPI audience community were the same type of people that I was working with at Unreal. But now I could serve even more people I could introduce the Unreal community to more business owners that they could learn from. And I could implement a lot of the assumptions that I had about how to build community at a higher level of scale than I could independently because Pat's been doing this for 13 years. He has a huge following. SBI has built a huge audience. And to do community well at a level of scale with that audience, I thought long-term was a really cool thing to learn how to do. It's very cutting edge. Um, it was just an op- too good of an opportunity to pass up. So, uh, you know, we hashed it out and came on the team in January of 2021 and have been running that team and that community effort for the last almost seven months. What What are the key ingredients to a great community? Meaning if you're a leader of one, and this, again, this can, I'll even broaden out what community is this is this is also kind of your culture at work this is the, the culture you're trying to build one of community i um and i'm curious from from your perspective and what you've learned because you've probably made mistakes and learned along the way and been able to get better because of those so for the person who's like hey, you know i need to do a better job at this i don't think i'm intentional enough about the community building aspect the culture building part about my team or my work what are some of the key ingredients to that it needs to have a clear purpose for existing. You know, I, I encourage people to think about community in, in a jobs to be done framework. Mm-hmm. What is somebody quote unquote hiring your community to do or solve for them? You need to have one clear purpose because if you don't create a purpose and socialize that, there's not going to be a filter on who joins and why they're all going to fill in the blank with their own expectation of what your community will do, which means mm-hmm. now you have to fulfill a large number of expectations that Mm. may not even be clear to you for that community to be successful for that person. So you need to have a really clear purpose up front. 
And then you really need to get into a service mindset of how do I fulfill that promise, that obligation I have made for my community members as quickly as possible so that they trust they made a good decision here. And that work pretty much never stops then. You know, I get uh, a lot of people who build communities, they, in a well-meaning way, try to focus on engagement metrics, how many topics are being posted, how many comments, how many active members. And to improve those numbers, they start thinking, how do I just drive more comments? How do I drive new topics? And they'll make their, uh, their whole strategy on those questions, which is serving to increase your engagement, quote unquote, but is that making a better experience for the community member? Is that actually solving the problem they wanted to be solved? Or are you creating busy work? Are you creating more stress that people feel like they have to keep up with this? So they have to contribute in this way. And now it's almost like work for them as opposed to something that they're really glad they're a part of. You need to come from a place of what will make this a gratifying experience to my community members? What will make this something that they'll say, I'm glad I participated in that because this happened because it's a gratifying experience that will keep them coming back and will get them coming to a space that isn't Facebook. You know, if you want to build a community off of Facebook, you need to make it something that people are excited to go check out and they don't mindlessly find themselves seeing because Facebook has engineered us to open Facebook. It doesn't work that way. in a lot of these community platforms, you have to create an experience that people consciously say, I want to engage in that. Yeah. Okay. You also, you've, you've been involved in podcasting for a while, but one of the most recently creative elements, great show I've listened and we've already talked about a few of it. I want to talk about the art of, of, like interviewing and putting together a show. Uh, you've also t- built a course to help other people do this, which I know uh, you you have a ton of students that have gone through that course. Um, what are some of the key, because I know a lot of people's secret ambition is to create a podcast, regardless of what they're currently doing, whether it's side hustle, like I started seven years ago when I had a full-time job as, as like my personal PhD program or whatever your reasoning is, what are some of the, the if we're going to go podcasting 101, the foundational elements to uh, the, the combination of having a show as well as and let's let's start diving into the interview aspect, because most shows, most people do want to talk to another person one on one. They're not necessarily the narrative uh, um, like a serial type podcast. They're more like one on one longer form conversations. Yeah. Well, again, I think you should get really in touch with your why as to why you're doing this podcast. I mean, both sides, who you're trying to impact, but also why am I doing this so I can know if this is being successful or not? Mm -hmm. And then it needs to be aligned with the possibility of your show and the likelihood of success. Like if your why is that you want to become a better public speaker, podcasting can be great for you, even if you have no listeners. Mm -hmm. You know, if you want to get more clients, it's going to be tougher because it's just a different type of show that you want to do. If you want to access people that you typically wouldn't have a reason to talk to, that's also something that podcasting is good for. If you're trying to build a massive audience and sell digital products, possible, but a longer path, right? So figure out why am I doing this? Because you need to know what that is because it's going to get hard and you're going to have to get through it. Then realize that podcasting is an audio medium. And you need to make the audio sound good. Mm-hmm. It's, it sounds so simple, but um, the bar is getting higher all the time on how good your podcast has to sound. Not, and not because people have a conscious understanding of good versus not good, but they'll hear something. And if it sounds like low quality, they'll say to themselves, this isn't good. They, they'll, they'll implicitly know that you're not taking it as seriously as you should. And so why should they? Mm-hmm. So it's going to be a lot of work. Um, I encourage people to think about the format of their show. Also, it needs to be something that is marketable, that is solving a need for people in a way that they're not having solved by someone else. Because again, if we think about this A plus level of work, you have to be doing something novel and valuable. And there are a lot of shows out there now. So if you want to interview experts in their field, you're going to be competing with Tim Ferriss, you're going to be competing with Ryan in a way. 
Uh, you, sometimes you have to think about it more abstractly. But the more that you can be novel and valuable, the better chance you have to build a really big show because you're differentiated and you do things differently. And you don't have to do some of these things that we assume we do. Like you don't have to do a weekly show. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do an interview show. Your show doesn't have to be an hour long. You know, these are all inputs you can change. You can do a solo show that you post twice a month that is 15 minutes or less. And that might actually be pretty compelling because the shorter your show is, especially starting now in 2021, the more likely someone coming to it fresh will say, oh, give this a chance. I'll hit play the first time. Mm -hmm. And when they hit play the first time, it better sound good. They better enjoy it or they're not coming back for number two. You failed the regret test. Mm -hmm. I'm also finding now, I'm surprised when people hear about creative elements, they go back to episode one. They listened to my episode with Seth Godin, and I'm so glad that episode one was with somebody like Seth and episode two <laughs> was with somebody like James because it's a really great audition for your show to a potential listener. From the beginning, they know, oh, this is legitimate. And I think you, you need that to stand out now if you're trying to play the audience building sponsorship uh, revenue game, which is what I'm trying to do with Creative Elements. And if you analyze where you were as a communicator during episode one and leading up to episode one versus where you are now, compare and contrast for me. I mean, I've definitely gotten less nervous on average talking to the people that I talked to, like yep. uh, talking with Seth Godin. I held my own pretty well, but I was nervous, man. Mm -hmm. He showed up in a sound booth with tea and professional <laughs> video. Like he was ready to go. And I was like, oh, hi, Mr. Godin. Here's what I want to talk about. And I think we'll have, uh, you know, 45 to 60 minutes if you have that. And he said, 45 minutes sounds good. I was like, okay, yes, yes. 40, my 45 minutes does sound good. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I luckily, because of Upside, the other podcast that I've been doing for more than three years now, I feel comfortable speaking on the mics and even I actually credit most of my public speaking comfort with again, startup weekend because yeah. I would lead those events and I have to get up on stage in front of a hundred people literally right in front of me and not only hold their attention, but like command their respect or that room devolved into just mayhem, you know, but you get a little bit better all the time. You get more efficient with your workflows. You realize, you know, how to craft a narrative arc, even in the order that you're asking questions so that you can hit the points that you want to hit within the time constraints that you have, you know, like interviewing is its own form of creativity. It has its own constraints. And I tell podcasters all the time, if you want your episodes to be 30 minutes, don't do 60 minute interviews because you're gonna have so much work in the edit and it's going to, you're going to be invited to ask questions that aren't really that additive to the experience. If you want a 30 minute podcast, do a 30 minute interview, do a 35 minute interview so that you're forced to ask the questions and build the story that you want to build in real time. Yeah. Just a couple of lessons there. I think getting the reps are, is, is like a lot of things. And then especially since it's an audio medium, you, you get to actually hear yourself learning or hear yourself yeah improving and to me that is really motivating when you can sense that you're becoming a better communicator which is a vital skill for just about any job or anything you're going to do or or leading a family leading a, at work whatever it may be and that to me is one of the i didn't really think about it going into it but is a massive benefit to regularly speaking on a microphone because you probably don't hate the sound of your voice i don't um, most people do because they rarely hear it. And then they yeah. hear it and think that does, that's not how I sound. I, I don't feel that way. Maybe at the beginning, but <laughs> I, I exactly think, how I sound now. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and hopefully you like it, you know, and I think you grow to, to, to hear, to me, hearing improvement is a really motivating factor in, in, in this work. And it's part of what keeps me going that and certainly feedback from, from, from others. And that's the one part I wanted to bring up with you is you've, you've tweeted about this recently and, and I completely agree in that the juice for me, and I'll say this, respond to the emails with it. Like, this is the juice. The juice is when you've impacted somebody's life that is a complete stranger and they may yeah. live on the other side of the world. 
and they listened to it at the dinner table or, or they talked about it at the dinner table from what they listened to during the day. And that is the juice, man. Like that is the fuel that, that keeps you saying like, this is why I need to prepare. This is why I need this to be good because it's impacting lives. And they let me know and, and talk about, talk to me about the feeling you have when you, when you can get a note or told from somebody that your work has helped them. It's incredible. It's like unmatched. It's insane. Even, you know, it's, you, you spend so much time building this stuff, making these things. And most of the time it feels like you're shouting out into the void. And then sometimes you start to get a good sense for like, well, not nobody's listening. I actually know like the five people who are listening and <clears throat> someone comes out of the woodwork and it's like, wow. And they'll say something like, I've been listening to this for the last six months. And you're like, wow, really? And if that one person is motivated to reach out and tell me this, they must represent some, you know, multiple on that of people who are also in that same boat that just haven't reached out to you. And it's just the best. I, I encourage people all the time. Like if you are impacted by somebody's work, reach out and tell them they will see it. I guarantee you they will see it. They may creators get a little bit more like closed off and, and numb to requests of their time because the more successful you get, the more that somebody wants a piece of you. But I feel like you don't get tired of hearing from people that you're making the work for saying, I appreciated this. I think yep. you see it every time. Definitely don't. I, uh, I was on a meeting with a leader today earlier, and he said one of his kind of mottos for living is that compliments are for the living. And he's a leader of a lot of people on his team. And I said, he goes, you know, a lot of people, they, you see somebody dies and, and, and there's all these, this outpouring of love and affection for their work and for them. And his whole mantra was, well, that's great. Don't, you know, you should continue to do that, but there, but you can also give the compliments to the person while they're alive. So, so when good. you sit, when you see somebody who has done something that you like, tell them, tell them. And you're like, and, and look at the look on their face. If, if you happen to be with them in person, like look at the look on their face when you give them a genuine, specific compliment on something they do. And certainly of a, a creator who a lot of our work is done on our own by ourselves in a room, uh, writing or putting something together or recording or, or editing, whatever it may be. And then you put it out in the world to be judged and it could be terrible, right? but it also could change somebody's life. And when you're told about that, that's the juice. I mean, that, that is the fuel that I don't think ever I've talked to John Maxwell and Simon Sinek about this. I mean, they get a billion compliments a day and they are like, no, it's awesome. I love it. This is why I do it. This is why I do it. I mean, and they get them constantly. Yes. So I, I think that's a, that's a really critical point. Um, this is really flown by Jay. I'm, I'm curious. Um, I, I, I always love like learning about like people as people. And this is sometimes hard, but you've, you've put on your website, you put the end of the blog post or um, things that you've published. You'll say, if you buy this course, it's going towards the down payment on my house. Or I, I'm, 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 I just got engaged to my fiance and, you know, we're going to pay for the wedding or whatever it may be. Like you, you'll say your money is going to pay for this. And I think that takes some guts. It takes some vulnerability. I'm curious about bringing your personal life, your whole self to your public life. Cause I feel like you're pretty much the same guy. I've met you in person. We've talked a lot and you're no different in any setting, whether we're recording or we're not. Talk about that that part of the authenticity to you and your story. Well, it's, it's part of the whole reason for why I'm doing this, right? It's the same, you know, I said my my why was to have personal flexibility, but it would be incredibly constricting if I was spending my time trying to be somebody else or not be myself. Now, of course, like there are filters and we all wear a mask to some degree of, you know, who we need to be for certain situations. But I really want to get to a point where it all feels just very aligned and comfortable because it's, it's similar to like when somebody says, you know, the hardest, like w when you start telling lies, you're going to get caught because you can't keep them all straight. <laughs> if you start putting on the mask of something that you're not, it's going to become really easy to spot 
inconsistencies and incongruencies with who you are and your character, yeah. it's super easy to lose trust, right? So, I mean, for me, I I think that we're in a moment where we're thinking about who we're learning from and who we're connecting with and what our community is. And we're looking at people more as people, you know, instead of uh, necessarily going to a university and getting a college or getting an education from those professors, because that's who the college has pulled together. We're doing at least our own continuing education through individuals. We're choosing like, this is who I want to learn this from because I trust them or I like their perspective on this. And we build like our own uh, tribe of mentors as Tim Ferriss has, has called it. Right. And I, I think a lot of that comes from who you are because mm-hmm. there are a lot of people who are going to functionally be doing the same things that you're doing, but we resonate not just with the function, but the form in the, the ethos, the, 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 the wabi sabi of, of who somebody is. And I want to introduce that into my work because it's just easier. Did you it's say wabi sabi? Yeah. Wa- Did I miss wa- something there? Did, have we talked about that before? No. Wabi, wabi sabi is, uh, I forget the language, but it's, I think it might be Japanese. It's just like this uh, term for things that are very distinct and, and unique in their own ways, even if they don't look uh, symmetrical or precise or technically beautiful. Okay. Um, everybody has their own wabi sabi our mutual friend jay akunzo calls it the waggle you know the thing that you do before you go up and uh bowl or uh swing the golf club or swing the baseball bat yeah. our own distinctive thing people want to see that and it's easier to be yourself when you can just be yourself and i think people appreciate it too because we've all through social media understood the good feeling of patronage you know yeah. for a long time to be like a patron meant patron of the arts and you you had to have a bunch of money and you were going to support artists and whatever but now we support each other and our friends and creators we love just by liking their work or retweeting their work and people do the same for us we understand what it feels like to be supported uh, and have patronage and i think the more that you lean into who you are the more you invite people to support you specifically well speaking of the things i just mentioned uh big, big life changes for you, man, over the last year, I guess. Right. I don't know the exact dates, but you, you, you bought a house and you got engaged, man. Tell me, take me inside uh, the process. I'm I'm more curious about the engagement. Like how did that go? (laughs) How'd you plan it? You being a creative guy, a lot of pressure. Like how, how was it? Oh gosh, it was hard, man. I mean, Mallory and I, we moved in together into an apartment in February of 2020. (laughs) <laughs> wow and then so you had not lived together prior to that we had not lived together prior. wow prior what a what a time okay and, your time uh yeah so shortly thereafter you know we're spending every minute of our lives together <laughs> and it worked it was you're good. gonna learn was, you're gonna learn something really quick yeah it was yeah. better even and we got to a point where through like a pretty rough beginning of 2020 we exited 2020 both having a lot of momentum in our careers and personal lives and Uh, We loved each other and we knew that, you know, we are in a position where we can stop renting. So let's just look at the start. Like, let's look into buying a house. She's a realtor. She's an incredible realtor. And that's a huge commitment. And in back of my mind, I knew that was the second commitment that I had made to this woman. You know, in my mind, the commitment was, this is who I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. Let's make that official before we buy the house. And that will probably be like a psychological load off for everybody involved. Um, but it was, it was quarantine. It was during the pandemic and we were taking it super seriously. Yeah. I had no idea how I was going to get a ring and surprise her with this. Um, and so I talked to a friend of mine and the initial idea was actually to get a ring doorbell and give this to, uh, give this to her as a gift of like significance of saying, (laughs) this is my commitment to you in the form of a house. This will go on our house. Uh, but it was a little, a little too cheesy, a little bit too much of a reach. Yeah. Um, and I had just had a chance conversation with a friend of mine, Miko, and he said he had just gotten engaged. He bought the ring online and he said something to me just offhand. He's like, did you know, um, uh, girls just tell their friends the type of ring that they want. I said, is that true? Is that real? Cause I was thinking I was, I would have to like take a wild guess or yeah. bring her into a shop, which seemed not that special. He was like, yeah, they just tell their friends. So I started like asking around to her friends and sure enough, 
found out exactly the ring that she wanted. Oh. Uh, ordered it online, had it shipped to my parents' house because we couldn't, I couldn't ship it to our apartment. Yep. Every package that came, she said, what is that? Where did it come from? Let's wipe it down. <laughs> <laughs> so I shipped it to my parents' house over Christmas, went and visited them, took it back, and uh, proposed at Franklin Park Conservatory during their annual lights show because wow. it was one of the few things we could do what felt like safely outdoors and also sure. made for good photos and a good romantic setting. Didn't want to just do it in the apartment where we spent the last eight months of our lives. Yeah. But yeah, it was a special time. Congrats, man. It's awesome. Uh, what, one more question for you, man. So, um, you know, I know you, a lot of people reach out to you who are probably earlier in their career and perhaps they just graduated from Ohio state or another great university, uh, from anywhere in the world. And they're not quite sure what they want to do other than the fact they know they want to put a dent in the world. They want to leave their mark. They want to positively impact others. But outside of that, not quite sure. I know this is tough, but I'm curious, what are some general pieces of life slash career advice you give to that person? I've been there. I know what it feels like. And I know it feels like I should be able to skip the line and do this now. Like anyone can do this at any time. Why can't I just change the world right now? And maybe you can. But also realize there's a lot to be said about experience. And sometimes it takes life experience to find out what you're good at, what you like to do, what people value. Um, because for the most part, people who come out of college uh, are one in tens of thousands. You know, you've been given the same education. You've probably done a lot of the same things. You haven't started to forge your own path yet. And it takes doing some of your own path finding to do something unique, novel, and valuable, you know, as I was saying about creativity. So I think the most important thing is to start getting in touch with what you want and your interests. And that takes trial and error. When I went to college, I went into the exploration program, which is undecided. And my advisor said, okay, congrats, you're in undecided, but this is not a magic bean. You actually need to try stuff so you can figure out what you want to decide on. Same is true for the rest of your life. You got to try stuff that you're drawn to. You'll find out the elements of it that you like, the elements that you don't like. You can cancel out or like try to pursue things that maximize the things you like and eliminate the things that you don't like. And to me, that's just the pursuit. That's the work is just the lifelong continuing to pursue the elements of my work that I enjoy, finding ways to eliminate the things that I don't, uh, or at least outsource them, right? And it takes time and space to give yourself the freedom to uh, try things out and reflect on how you feel about it. And I feel like you uh, intuitively have done a really good job of building quality relationships. And that's what is kind of the, the, the makings of a, of a great life and career. Oh, yeah. um, and I, I find that that being part of part of that that's that's sitting right here with this mindset of of it takes time it takes actual experiences meaning you have to do the work not just think about it but actually do it and then along the way building those relationships with people where they're mutually beneficial you but you both add value to each other's lives and, and having a series of those and not in a transactional way and not in a networking way but in a way of building real genuine relationships that's what's led to the, the good moments in your work. And I know it's what's led to the good moments in mine as well. You can feel when you're around somebody that you vibe with and who is bringing out the best parts of you. Yeah. And that's another thing that you need to tap into and feel when it happens, because that will guide you towards the people you want to spend more time around the people you want to spend less time around. It's just like exploring your interests. It's exploring uh, the social circles that you want to find yourself in. Because again, we're social beings. We want to be around people but we don't have infinite availability to be around people. We have to make choices and that's totally in your control. You can, you can spend your time around who you want to spend your time around. And in fact, I think you should be fairly ruthless about making those decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Jay, this is awesome, man. You know, I could talk to you all day. I really appreciate it. Um, creative elements, 
Learning Leader Show. Awesome crossover here. I'm glad we got a chance to do it. I doubt it will be the last one. Uh, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep at it. One, one last thing, though, I, I just, just remembered. I heard you have a secret ambition to write a book. Is that true? What's happening? <laughs> I do, uh, and it may or may not be happening in real time as we're doing this podcast because, you know, I was blown away by the the elegance of how Tim Ferriss wrote Tribe of Mentors. Yeah. And maybe something similar is happening right now with the creative elements. Mm, I Hard love it. Love it. Oh, well, I'm excited for that, man. And uh, thanks so much for being here. I know we're going to continue our dialogue as we both progress, man. It's been so cool. Hey, thanks, Ryan. Really appreciate this. 